Road for the X-ray tower. Wind 20020, gust 26, runway 18 left, clear for the option. 18 left, clear to option, 314 X-ray. So you want to learn how to fly, but why does it seem like you need a degree in meteorology in order to understand the forecast that you get as a pilot? Today, I just want to tell you that you're not alone. Everybody struggles with TAFs and METARs when they're first getting started. If you plan on being a pilot, you have to know how to decipher those. Not only are you required to know how to do that on your written exam and your check ride, but you're also required to check the weather anytime you fly in or out of an airport. And TAFs and METARs are your official weather products, so let's spend a few minutes today and learn how to decipher those. The first thing I want to talk about today are surface observations. This is the current weather that's being observed from the ground at an airfield. And these fall into two categories, METARs and species. METAR stands for Meteorological Aerodrome Report. And if you notice, I can't pronounce that M word very well. So I'm glad we use this acronym. Anyways, the word aerodrome there just means airport or airfield. And what a METAR is, is a regularly scheduled weather report that comes out once every hour. A speci, on the other hand, is a special weather report, and this is just an unscheduled weather report that comes out between the hourly METARs. And these will usually come out when there's bad weather or rapidly changing weather. The big picture is that they want you to have the most current weather observation, and METARs and species are how they do that. And when you get these reports, this is what they're going to look like. And if you're like me, and this is the first time you've ever seen one of these, this probably looks like a bunch of Chinese to you. But don't worry, it's not as hard as you think, and I'm going to explain all of it to you right now. But one thing you should be aware of first is that the information in these surface observations is always in the same order. And that's going to make it a little bit easier for us to decipher these. But just keep in mind that not all this information here is required. So you won't always see significant weather, dew point, or remarks. Let's pull up aviationweather.gov and take a look at some of the METARs across the country. This first little grouping of letters is the airport identifier code. In the continental U.S., all the airport identifier codes start with the letter K followed by three digits. And by using this code, you can easily search for the weather report you need. So now, I know that I'm looking at Tulsa International's METAR right now. After the identifier, the very next grouping of numbers is the date and time that the observation was made. And as you can see by the Z at the end there, this date and time are in Zulu. The first two numbers in this grouping represent the day of the month. So we know this observation was made on the 25th. Then the next four digits represent the Zulu time it was made. And unfortunately, if you want to know the local time it was made, you'll have to convert from Zulu to local time. Here in Tulsa during daylight savings time, we're plus five, so I know that this was made at 8.53 p.m. Here's something kind of weird that you'll want to know about if you look at these observations later in the day. If the Zulu time you see here is past midnight, that's also going to roll over your Zulu day. So in this example, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, this observation was made on the 24th of March. If this whole Zulu thing is brand new to you, and you're scratching your head right now, I'll put a link in the description below of a video I made a few months back. It explains the Zulu conversions in a lot more detail, and you can check that out once this video is done. Alright, let's go back to the next line of information on the METAR. And this little grouping represents the wind direction and the speed. So it looks like we've got 040 at 11. And these first three digits here are the wind direction. So we know the wind is coming from the northeast at 40 degrees. And the wind direction is always where the wind's coming from. The only weirdos I know that tell you where the wind is going to is the army. And how do they know where the wind's going? Sorry, I'm getting distracted. These second two digits are the wind speed. And 11 kT stands for 11 knots. Now on occasion, you will see the wind speed look like this with a G in the middle. In this example, the winds are 11 knots, gusting to 21. And let me tell you, real pilots aren't born, they're made by flying in these type of conditions. The next thing we have here is the visibility, and this SM means statute miles. So in this example, the visibility is 10 statute miles. And this just means that you can see stuff that's 10 statute miles away. And for those of you who didn't know, a statute mile is 5,280 feet, and that's a little bit different than a nautical mile. Nautical miles are one minute of latitude, and I explain that more in another video. Now, as you may remember from past episodes, visibility is important to us because it has to be good in order to legally fly under visual flight rules. And how good the visibility needs to be depends on the type of airspace that you're in. 
but in controlled airspace, you need ceilings of at least a thousand feet and the visibility has to be at least three miles. Now we'll talk more about the ceilings here in just a second, but I go into a lot more detail on the different types of airspace and the weather you need on my videos on airspace. So if we go back to the METAR and we take a look at Tulsa's visibility, are we legal to fly VFR with 10 statute miles of visibility? And the answer is yes, because as long as we have three statute miles or better, we can fly VFR. And that's an example of a test question that you might see on your written exam. In fact, let's take a look at the actual testing supplement that you're going to be using on the written test. Here at JFK International, the visibility is only a half statute mile. So in this example, we can't fly under visual flight rules. And just so there's no confusion, this MDW, which is Chicago Midway, is a little bit difficult to read. This one is one and a half statute miles, and so legally we're still not VFR. Sometimes, after the visibility, you'll see these two letter identifiers. These let you know that there's some significant weather that you need to be aware of, and a lot of times that's what's causing that low visibility. And if we take a look at one of these little codes, these really are made of two parts. The first of which is either a minus or plus sign, and this is called a qualifier. The other is the actual weather phenomenon that's being observed on the field. The RA here stands for rain, and the qualifier lets us know how much rain we're actually getting. The minus sign lets us know that the intensity is very light. If there's no symbol, that means it's moderate. Then if you see a plus sign, whatever it is, it has a heavy intensity. So if you ever see a plus sign, that means it's like a circus fire because it's intense. <laughs> You're welcome for that one. Anyways, now we know that the weather they're seeing at the field is light rain. And now let's take a look at some of the other symbols that you might see in this section. This chart comes from Chapter 13 of the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. And if you look over here at the qualifiers, you'll notice that there's a couple more other than the plus and minus sign. One of the most common qualifiers is this VC acronym, and that just means in the vicinity, and is commonly used with VCTS. And as you can see, TS means thunderstorms, so if you were to get this code, that would mean thunderstorms are in the vicinity, but not necessarily on the airport itself. Now a lot of times, the code for the weather phenomenon will be listed by itself, but it's not uncommon for one of these descriptors to be paired with precipitation or something that's obscuring the visibility. One example that's common during the winter time in snowy areas is BLSN. And if we took a look at the qualifier and the weather phenomenon, we'll notice that it's blowing snow that they're reporting at that airfield. Here's one I've seen before when I was up in Alaska, FZFG. And if we take a look down here, we'll see that that's freezing fog. Now most of these codes make sense for what they're reporting. RA, I can remember that that means rain. But who in the world decided BR should be missed? Let me give you some quick memory aids for these hard ones before we move on. If MI doesn't make sense for shallow, think many instead. BC stands for patches. Think blotchy. Hail is GR, which stands for gravel falling out of the sky and putting a bunch of dings in my car. For mist, think baby rain. Na, 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 baby rain, baby rain, baby rain. If I hear you singing this in the airport, I'm going to know you watched this video. Then, FU stands for fumes. Were you getting concerned on that one? And I'm sorry I don't have anything for you on this one. Whoever decided spray should be PY is an idiot. Now, sometimes when the visibility is really low and the airport has the right equipment, you'll see a weird collection of letters and numbers like this. And what this is, is a different type of visibility reading called runway visual range, often abbreviated RVR. And basically what this is, is a laser beam that shoots across the runway and measures the visibility in feet. And as you can imagine, this is a lot more precise way to measure visibility. And you'll be learning a lot more about RVR when you go for your instrument rating. But I'll at least show you how to decipher this code. And don't worry, it's pretty simple. This R04 means that the measurement was taken on runway 4. Then the second measurement is our RVR in feet. So the RVR in this case is 2,200 feet. And if there's parallel runways on the field, you might see an R or an L after the runway number. So don't let that throw you off. That's just telling you specifically what runway that is. The next readings we'll look at are the ones that tell you the cloud cover. And this is an important one to know how to decipher because you have to know what the ceilings are at in order to legally fly under visual flight rules. And the first step in doing that is determining what constitutes a ceiling. Here's a look at the different types of cloud cover that you might see on a METAR or a SPECI. Now sky clear is pretty obvious. That means there's zero clouds in the sky. And on the weather observation, that'll usually be indicated by an SKC or a CLR. And if the sky's clear, there's obviously not a ceiling. When you see the word few on a METAR, 
That means about one eighth to two eighths of the sky is covered with clouds. And anytime you see this, this does not constitute a ceiling. SCT indicates a scattered deck, and that means that the sky is somewhere between three eighths to four eighths covered. I like to think of scattered skies as half clouds and half sky. And anytime you see this, this is also not a ceiling. Next, we have the broken cloud deck, and the code for this one is BKN. And you'll see this one anytime the cloud coverage is between 5 eighths to 7 eighths. And this one's important to remember for you because this one does constitute a ceiling. And if the clouds are too low, you can't take off under visual flight rules. And we'll talk more about that here in just a second, but for now, let's talk about the overcast layer. And you'll know it's overcast because of the letters OVC. And when this occurs, you know that the sky is completely covered with clouds. And if that's true, then you know that this is also a ceiling. But even with a ceiling, we can still be VFR as long as the clouds are high enough. And if you remember from earlier, we said that in order to be VFR, we need a minimum ceiling of 1,000 feet AGL and a minimum visibility of three statute miles. And if you look back at the METAR, you'll notice something weird in this cloud coverage section. So obviously this is a scattered deck, but there's only three numbers here. And that's totally normal on these. You have to add two zeros to the end of these numbers in order to get the height of these clouds. And now that we know that, we can determine that this is a scattered deck at 25,000 feet AGL. And anytime you see these cloud numbers here, those numbers are always in AGL. So now let me ask you a question. Am I VFR here at Adams Field, KLIT? Well, the visibility is 10 statute miles, so we know we're good there because we need a minimum of three statute miles. And if we take a look at that cloud deck, we can see that it's broken, so that does constitute a ceiling. And now we just add those two zeros to see that this cloud layer is at 7,000 feet AGL. So yes, we are VFR here at Adams Field. What about this airfield right here? I can see that there's a cloud layer at 700 feet AGL. Don't forget that a scattered layer is not a ceiling. Only broken and overcast constitutes a ceiling. So once again, we're VFR at this airfield as well. Just be cautious with all this because there can be multiple cloud decks depicted on a METAR. And while it's good to know about those few and scattered layers, the ones that constitute a ceiling are the big ones we're concerned about. Next, we have the temperature followed by the dew point. If you ever see this with just one number, that's just the temperature. And I went into a lot of detail on the relationship between temperature and dew point in the last lesson. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that today, but I just want to point out the temperature and the dew point are the same here. I bet we've either got some really low clouds or it's raining here. Yup, look at this, light rain. See, this stuff's pretty handy to know. Next up we have this A followed by a four digit number. This is the altimeter setting. And I know you're probably thinking, well this is 2,998 inches of mercury. No, you have to add a period in the middle here. And that'd be crazy if it was though, right? And last but not least, we have the remark section of the METAR. And this is indicated by the letters RMK. I'm not gonna go into detail on all the remarks you might see on a METAR because that would take us all day and it'd be really boring. But I am gonna point out a few that I think are important and maybe one or two that you might see on the test. The first one I want to point out is this AO2 because it's on a lot of METARs. And when you see this code, you know this observation was made with an automated weather station. But with that in mind, I know that this METAR was looked over by a human being before it was pushed out. If it wasn't looked over by a human being and the report was fully automated, you'd see the word auto at the beginning of the METAR. And so that tells me that this particular METAR was made completely by machines. And if you've ever watched Terminator, you can see how this could be a problem. Or just the fact that machines break all the time. And something that might alert me that there is a problem with this METAR is a dollar sign at the end of it. And this just indicates that there's something that needs to be checked by maintenance on the system. So I just take that METAR with a grain of salt. Now let me show you one that might be on the written test because this one's kind of tricky. Just like in the previous sections, this RA here stands for rain, and the B stands for began. So they're trying to tell you what time the rain began, and it was 35 minutes past the hour. So if we look over here at what time the METAR was produced, we can see that it has to be before this time, otherwise the observer wouldn't have known about it. So we can deduce that the rain started at 1835 Zulu. For the rest of these remarks, I'm going to put a link in the description for a quick reference guide from www.weather.gov. I really recommend saving it as a PDF on your iPad somewhere. And for you dinosaurs out there, you can print it out and put it on your kneeboard if you want. And as you can see, this is a pretty handy tool if you're trying to get the skinny on the weather. Okay, so now I want to take a quick look at what a TAF is. 
TAF stands for Terminal Aerodrome Forecast. And anytime you see the word forecast here, you know you're getting the future weather prediction at an airfield. So if you're trying to get an idea of what the weather is going to be at the airfield you're landing at, these are what you want to look at. And don't worry, these are really similar to the METARs, so this shouldn't take nearly as long to explain as they did. And if you look at the information that's in a TAF, you'll notice that it's basically the same, except there's no temperatures or altimeter settings. And you typically won't see remarks either. And something I forgot to tell you earlier about the temperatures on a METAR is that they're always shown in Celsius. You might as well just quit using Fahrenheit now. The aviation community primarily uses Celsius. All right, so let's pull up some real TAFs from aviationweather.gov. And when you look at these, you'll notice that each individual airport might have multiple lines. The first line you see here with the airport name is the overarching forecast that lasts somewhere between 24 to 30 hours. Now most TAFs only last 24 hours, but big airports like Los Angeles here have TAFs that last 30 hours because they have long international flights and those guys need to know the weather a lot more in advance. Alright, so let's zoom in here at the main TAF line at Jackson International and take a closer look. And just like on the METAR, this first grouping of information is the date and time this thing was produced. But now, right after that, we see another grouping of numbers that represents the date and time that this TAF is valid. And all this is telling us is that this TAF is valid on the 26th day of the month from 1200 Zulu to the 27th day of the month to 1200 Zulu. And as you can see, this is a 24 hour TAF like I was talking about earlier. And if you take a quick look down at LAX, you'll see that this one's valid from the 26th day of the month at 1400 Zulu to the 27th day of the month at 1800 Zulu. And this is the 30 hour TAF I was talking about. Next, just like the METAR, we have the wind speed and direction. And sometimes you'll see this VRB on both TAFs and METARs, and that just means the winds are variable. And that lets you know that it's coming from all different directions. And just like the METAR, you'll see the visibility, notable weather, and the cloud conditions. And I just want to point out to you this, baby rain, baby rain. And in addition to the important baby rain, you might also see this P in front of the visibility. And that's just telling you that the prevailing visibility is expected to be six statute miles. And in plain English, that means that they're expecting it to be better than 6 miles. So as you already know, the weather can change quite a bit in a 24-hour period. So because of that, one general overarching TAF isn't enough. And because of that, a lot of times you'll see these two types of TAF lines in the forecast. A from line, like you see here, means there's going to be a pretty significant change in the weather. And that change starts on the 26th day at 1700 Zulu. And that's 1700 until further notice, not 1700 to 000. From lines last until something else takes its place. And as you can see here, this next from line does take its place on the 27th day, and that just so happens to be 0 hundred hours. And as you can see, if they're not expecting a lot of big changes in the weather in a 24 hour period, you may only see one or two from lines. But when you see a lot of from lines like this, that means the weather's changing rapidly, and you need to really pay attention to the time that you're going to show up at the airfield and make sure that you're going to be VFR. Next we have these becoming lines, and these can be on their own line or they can be stuck in a from line. And I call these tempo bands because they're very temporary and once the time is up on them, you go back to reading the from lines. And if we take a closer look at this tempo band up at Memphis, you'll notice that the valid dates and times are really similar to the overarching TAF. Alright, so this becoming line is only valid from the 13th day of the month at 1000 Zulu to the 13th day of the month at 1200 Zulu, so that's only two hours. And once those times are up, we should go back to using the from lines. Let's take a quick look at some of the notable weather on this TAF because this could be a test question. On some TAF lines, you might see a prob followed by a number. In this example, it's telling you that there's a 40% chance of whatever information is coming after that. So in this example, on the 12th day from 2000 to 2200 Zulu, there's a 40% chance you could see one statute mile visibility, thunderstorms, rain, and overcast at 800 with cumulonimbus clouds. And anytime I see TS for thunderstorms or CB for cumulonimbus, those are really important to me and I really want to pay attention to those. Now sometimes you'll see these tempo lines right here, and these are just telling you that some really temporary weather is coming through. In this example, it looks like from 1200 Zulu to 1400, we're going to get a half statute mile visibility, and that's because of fog. Now I don't know why they put them on the testing supplement because I hardly ever see them on real TAFs, but these equal signs right here just mean that that's the end of that TAF for that airport. And now you know how to read TAFs and METARs, and knowing really is half the battle. Now, do yourself a favor and continue studying with this video right here. And since you smashed that like button before you did, I've got something special for you. Baby rain.